A reading from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 16, verses 19 through 31. Listen for the word of God astir through these words of Jesus' parable. There was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen and who feasted sumptuously every day. And at his gate lay a poor man named Lazarus, covered with sores, who longed to satisfy his hunger with what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs would come and lick his sores. The poor man died and was carried away by the angels to be with Abraham. The rich man also died and was buried. In Hades, where he was being tormented, he looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. He called out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am in agony in these flames. But Abraham said, Child, remember that during your lifetime you received good things, and Lazarus in like manner evil things. But now he is comforted that here, and you are in agony. Besides all this, between you and us a great chasm has been fixed, so that those who might want to pass from here to you cannot do so. And no one can cross from there to us. He said, Then, Father, I beg you to send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, that he may warn them, so that they will not also come into this place of torment. Abraham replied, They have Moses and the prophets. They should listen to them. He said, No, Father Abraham, but if if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. He said to him, If they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced, even if someone rises from the dead. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Well, good morning, First Christian Church of Mineral Wells, Texas. Good morning. It is good to be with you. I bring warm greetings from Bright Divinity School on the campus of Texas Christian University. On behalf of our president, Newell Williams, our dean, Jaretta Marshall, our faculty, staff, and student body. Before we take off into the sermon proper, I want to give a quick update on your, our Divinity School. As you know, seminaries nationwide have been on a rapid decline in enrollment for the past decade. Bright Divinity School, however, has experienced two years of growth. In fall 2015, our entering class was 70% larger than our fall 2014 class. Our fall 2016 entering class was our largest since 2005. Overall, enrollment has grown too, with disciples being our largest denominational cohort. These numbers energize and excite us, but two years do not a trend make, unfortunately. We are hopeful, however, about our spring 2017 and fall 2017 classes. The Office of Admissions is grateful to congregations like yours who continue to find value in graduate theological education and for sending students our way. Thank you. May I pray with you? Sing it over again to us, scandalous word of life. Let us more of its wonder see, scandalous word of life, word of life and beauty. Teach us faith and duty, challenging word 
outrageous word, scandalous word of life. Amen. There's a working hypothesis that I would like to test with you. Ministers do not pick their vacation time based on family reunions, travel agent specials, or any other logical factor. Rather, ministers choose their vacations based on the revised common lectionary. (laughs) Though I cannot speak for all ministers, I can say for myself that this parable is not on my top ten list of passages to preach. Truth be told, this parable is high on my top ten list of passages never to preach. Ministers know this, so they stealthily concoct a plan to be absent and invite an unknowing guest minister saying only the date of invitation, September 25th, 2016. But ministers omit the key detail that the congregation is in the practice of following the revised common lectionary. I need to get better at calling a minister's bluff. Instead of replying with an eager, yeah, I should return the invitation with a question asking, do y'all follow the revised common lectionary? There's a second hypothesis too. You're here this wet morning to be nice to your guest preacher. Here's the reasoning. If your minister is really following the Revised Common Lectionary, which for this year follows the Lucan account of Jesus, the church should be, well, empty. Have you heard these stories from Luke? Mary starts off singing, God has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. God has brought down the powerful from their thrones and lifted up the lowly. God has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty. Well, if the words of Mary are not enough to convince us of the thrust of this gospel, Consider Jesus' sermon on the plain. Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who are hungry now, for you will be, you will be filled. But woe to you who are rich, for you have received your consolation. And woe to you who are full now, for you will be hungry To add to the indictment of wealth and excess of food, how about the rich fool who tore down his barns to build bigger ones only to have his life demanded of him that very night? Luke is famous for parables. More parables occur in Luke's gospel than any other, and many of them are our favorites. The Good Samaritan, for example. Who could forget the three parables of Luke 15? The lost coin, the lost sheep, and the prodigal son. Parables like Jesus told come across as simple stories and good stories and even convenient stories. But when we cross the bridge to Luke 16, we encounter parables of challenge. Take, for example, the parable of the shrewd servant with its closing punch line. You cannot serve God and wealth. This is a challenging word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Just before today's parable of poor man Lazarus, Luke the narrator tells us that the Pharisees, who were lovers of money, heard all this and they ridiculed Jesus. So Jesus said to them, you are those who justify yourselves in the sight of others, but God knows your hearts. For what is prized by human beings is an abomination in the sight of God. The law and the prophets were in effect until John came. Since then, the good news of the kingdom of God is proclaimed, and everyone tries to enter it by force. But it is easier for heaven and earth to pass away than for one stroke of the letter in the law to be dropped. Well, this is an outrageous word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. 
Is it any wonder then that no one ever hears a teaching or a parable from Jesus and says, go on, tell us another one. In fact, after his first sermon, folks are ready to run Jesus off a cliff. If one is to follow Jesus, or embody the word of the Lord like Jesus, or preach parables as told by Jesus, the response from the gathered crowd or congregation should never be, Oh, good job, preacher, or that sermon was nice, reverend. No, the reaction, at least in this context, should be, Preacher, we need to see you at the cliffs of Mineral Wells State Park, <laughs> promptly after the service. We can be sure that we have heard the challenging, outrageous, and scandalous word of the Lord when we squirm, when it hits too close to home and our pocketbooks, when the comfortable are made uncomfortable and the uncomfortable are made comfortable. This is how we know we've encountered the Word made flesh. The parable of Jesus before us this morning has scandalized and tormented me this week. And if this sermon does its job, and God works through this preacher's stammering tongue, you too will be scandalized and tormented by the Word of the Lord. But no cliffs, please. There was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen and who feasted sumptuously every day. If Jesus has already offended you as he has me at this early point in the parable, you must be an alum of Texas Christian University. At TCU, we clothe ourselves and our institution in purple and fine, fabulous fabric. As for the feasting, our students, faculty, and staff, with the right meal plan, can feast e sumptuously each and every day from an, an all-you-can-eat buffet in the Brown Lupton University Union cafeteria. The sumptuous spread of food makes a Luby's Luann platter look like scrappy leftovers. At the gate of the rich man's palatial, colonial estate was a poor man named Lazarus, covered with sores who longed to satisfy his hunger with what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs would come and lick his sores. At the metaphorical gates of TCU, along the parallel sidewalk of University Drive next to the record store and Dutch's hamburgers, there is a poor woman named, well, I don't know her name exactly, but she is named and known by God. She's an African-American woman. She is poor, selling her art canvases of cows and monkeys for a meager fee. I don't know if she's covered in sores. I've never gotten that close, honestly. But she wears the same clothes each and every day. Her feast is the refuse from Dutch's and other food joints along the strip. A chasm of disparity has been fixed by humanity between the privileged man and the poor man Lazarus, between people like me with a fine educational pedigree and a good paying job, and the poor woman whose name I don't know on University Drive. Jesus describes the characters in this parable by their economic status, or lack thereof. One is a candidate for the October cover of Forbes magazine. The other, well, is what some politicians speak of as a deplorable, or having nothing left to lose. There is one thing the poor man cannot lose, though, and that is his name, Lazarus. Which, mean God, which means God helps. Lazarus is the only proper name ever given to a character in any of Jesus' parables, which adds to Luke's evidence that God's ear is most closely attuned to the prayers and tears of the poor, the oppressed, and the unnoticed. Both men die just as you and I will, except there are notable differences here too. 
The poor man died, and before the Jerusalem city morgue could even retrieve Lazarus' body and burn it with the day's trash, angels carry Lazarus away to be with Abraham. For the rich man, however, the city morgue does reach him, and he has a most proper burial, likely just outside the city limits, in a properly marked grave with an obelisk to mark the height of stature of the person below buried. The lack of a proper burial for Lazarus does not surprise the Pharisees after all. Lazarus had no money. He was unclean, and the authorities needed to properly dispose of Lazarus' body. Tension builds as the Pharisees wait to hear the fate of the rich man. Without a doubt, they are rehearsing in their minds Deuteronomy 28, 3 and 4. Blessed shall you be in the city, and blessed shall you be in the field. Blessed shall be the fruit of your womb, the fruit of your ground, and the fruit of your livestock, both the increase of your cattle and the issue of your flock. Psalm 1, 3 and 4 closely follows. In all that he does, he prospers. The wicked are not so. The Pharisees had bought hook, line, and sinker into the dreadful theology that God helps those who help themselves. Far from the minds of Pharisees and perhaps distant from our minds too is the law prescribing that the harvest be shared with the poor. Leviticus 19, 9 and 10, when you reap the harvest of your land, you shall not strip your vineyard bare or gather the fallen grapes of your vineyard. You shall leave them for the poor and the immigrant. In Deuteronomy 15, 8, open your hand willingly, lending enough to meet the need, whatever it may be. Are these the laws Jesus referred to when he said just before our parable that it is easier for heaven and earth to pass away than for one stroke of a letter in the law to be dropped? The word of the Lord? Imagine the scandalous and outrageous challenge when Jesus tells the Pharisees the fate of the rich man. He is in Hades being tormented. The chasm created by humanity between us and them, between the haves and have-nots, is now reversed by God. Is this what Jesus meant when he taught, saying, Indeed, some are last who will be first, and some are first who will be last? The word of the Lord If we take the parable before us today and reinterpret it in the light of the news this past week, there can be no doubt that humanity has fixed a chasm between the dichotomies of black and white, between the disadvantaged and the privileged, between the perceived inferior and the perceived supreme. Over the last 11 days, Three persons of color have been shot and killed by police. Tyre King, an eighth grader at the Lyndon McKinley STEM School in Columbus, Ohio. Terrence Critcher, a 40-year-old God-loving, faithful father of four, church choir member, and a student at Tulsa Community College. Lamont Scott, husband, father, brother, parked in his car, reading a book in Charlotte, North Carolina. The bodies of these three persons now rest in the bosom of Abraham. Their lives matter. Black lives matter. The modern parable continues to interpret us, too. I do not know that we are in Hades, and I don't know that flames are tormenting us, but our privilege does. Privilege torments us as it blinds us to the needs of others and fuels the sins of systemic racism and white supremacy. 
Privilege torments us as it tells us that we can choose not to acknowledge the suffering of our black neighbors. Privilege torments us as we change the channel so that we don't have to see an alarming video of an unarmed black man being shot by police. Privilege torments us as we try to rationalize and justify the killings, blaming the victim. Privilege torments us as it suggests to us that we can call out to Father Abraham saying, Have mercy on us and send Lazarus or Tyre or Terence or Keith to dip the tips of their fingers in water and cool our parched tongues. For we are in agony in these flames, in this privilege. Abraham responds saying, Children, remember that during your lifetime you received your good things. And Lazarus, Tyre, Terence, and Keith, in like manner, evil things. But now they are comforted here and you are in agony. Besides all this, between you and us a great chasm has been fixed so that those who might want to pass from here to you cannot do so. And no one can cross from there to us. The chasm of which Abraham speaks has been fixed not by humanity, but by God. Wealth, privilege, and supremacy are all reversed by God. Were we not tormented by our privilege, we would have seen God's justice coming on earth. The once rich man no doubt an ancestor of Charles Dickens, Jacob Marley, begins to get the point and then pleads for Abraham to send Lazarus to his five siblings. Warn them about the torment of privilege, he cries. Abraham answers, they have Moses and the prophets. They should listen to them. The tormented one retorts, no, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. He said to him, if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced, even if someone rises from the dead. I would love to tell you that this parable ends with some hope for tormented people of privilege. But Jesus does not give us an easy out. It is true that we can unfix the chasm that humanity has fixed, joining ourselves with God's agenda of transforming and restorative justice, we can work with one another toward this effort, and that is true. This parable and the sermon, though, end in a place of challenge and tension. You may even be reconsidering a rendezvous at the cliffs of the state park with your guest preacher promptly after the service. As a means of acquittal, my alibi is that this parable belongs to Jesus, not to me. And to be honest, I'm tormented too. But hear this. It is easier for heaven and earth to pass away than for one stroke of a letter and the law to be dropped. The one who tells this parable is the one who will be raised from the dead. Be persuaded. Be convinced. We can trust Jesus at his challenging word outrageous word, scandalous word, because it is the word of life. Thanks be to God. Amen. Amen.